So I'd like to start by saying thank you to Steve for hosting us here. And I'm very excited to help him begin to inaugurate this beautiful space for Japan Craft 21. And if you're not familiar with Steve's work with Japan Craft 21, I, I really encourage you to check it out. He's doing very exciting and wonderful and generative things with that work. Recording in progress. And of course, we know that Alex has long been a champion of generative culture, which then has a wonderful trickle down or trickle up effect of, of being generative then for the community as well. And, and thanks to Kara for being such a champ on tech and to Harasan for his support as well. So um, let's begin. Um, I wanted to just please take 30 seconds. The house that we're sitting in, um, we were when I say we, there's a there is a um a Japanese traditional carpentry company, a komoten, which I've been working with uh in, in a supportive way for many years. Uh there is a school which we started, which is to support and to teach joinery and uh to young. Uh, young working carpenters and mud wall plastering to young working um, plasters and garden techniques to young working gardeners. And so we started this school. So we have the carpentry company, we have the school, and we have Japan Craft 21. And the city of Kyoto had, has acquired this house, this property, and they're renting it to us for a very reasonable amount. And we will be restoring it. So it, they wanted to re, they wanted to maintain, they wanted to preserve this extraordinary property. Otherwise, it'd be torn down, and you know who knows what would be built. And so this is this is a, a great opportunity for us and for the city and for Kyoto. So it's it's a fifteen room house, and we're sitting in two of those rooms right now. Great. So well, let's start with Alex. And uh, what we wanted to do here is is open a dialogue. I, I know some of you are very much already a part of this work already with generative travel or generative tourism or generative culture or generative living. And so I had this idea. I'm here for the Gyan Matsuri and have been thinking about this subject for a long time. Um, uh, something like that that has lasted more than a thousand years. What can we do to help ensure that it lasts another thousand years, especially when we're not sure the planet's going to last another thousand years. So for me, this is a really compelling question that I'm thinking about a lot of the time. And um, Alex has really pioneered so much amazing work in this area. So thank you so much for joining us, Alex. I um, would love to hear what you have to say. We'll each speak for 20 minutes, Alex, and then myself, and then Steve, about our ideas on generative tourism or generative travel and how we get there from here. And then at the end, we'll have a half an hour for Q&A. Alex, over to you. Thank you. It's, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. So it's great to uh, be uh, chatting with you and Steve. And uh, both of you are, uh, can you hear me? <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, and both of you, of course, are, are leaders in this field. And I, I, I wanted to just today just throw out some ideas. First of all, generative tourism. Uh, that is, a I have to admit, a word I've not come across before. And I noticed in the various chat streams and so on on Facebook, a lot of people were saying, well, what is this? And I'm not sure I know what it is either. And so I think maybe we can all talk about that uh, and start to think, what, what do we, what did, I think maybe, Catherine, this, this might have been your uh, word. Uh, so maybe before I say anything, can I throw it back to you? And you can, could you please tell us what you think generative tourism is? Yeah, for sure. Thanks. A uh, good question. Well, I, I thought that I came up with that term myself. And then um, someone asked you if it was related to regenerative tourism, which I hadn't heard of, but I looked up. And, and I think I, I, I jokingly said, no, remedial. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Well, and that's a good point. I think that's what we're all concerned yeah. about yeah. is that um, I, I think that our basic challenge is, is that we have been conditioned through no fault of our own to 
live and work and operate and travel in a kind of consumeristic mode, which is about what can I get from this experience? And what I'm suggesting with generative travel, that it's really not about what we can get, that there's really nothing to get, right? We can spend a lot of time trying to get something that's ill-defined and that is basically impossible to get, or we can cultivate an experience that is really about enjoying ourselves wherever we are, enjoying our time with the people who we are with, enjoying the environment that we find ourselves in, and uh, contributing to all of those things, contributing to the environment, contributing to the people, contributing to the place, contributing to the feeling of that place. So that's what I would call generative travel. It can be applied to anything, generative living, generative working. Let's say that we are meant to be here and that there's nothing to fix, but that we have the wisdom to see that the way we're doing it is not working so well. So then how would we like to do it? And, and that in my mind is, is generative. Thank you. Well, then I think that's pretty much maybe what we all would have thought. Uh, I, uh, before I um, talk, I wanted to, uh, I think probably a lot of people here know something of my background, but there might be people who don't. And so I thought I'd just quickly do a little bit of self-introduction. Um, you know, I've lived in Japan a, a long time. I came as a boy in uh, 1964. <laughs> so next year will be 60 years uh, in Japan. And when I was in, in college, I traveled around, hitchhiked around, and discovered this amazing valley in Ishikoku called Ia, where I ended up buying an old thatched house when I was around 20, and which is called Chiori. And that house since that time, which is now 50 years or so ago, is still my center. It's the center of my activities. And for many years, uh, it was just volunteers, people, you know, backpackers. People would come up. We'd have fun and have parties. Uh, there was no running water. We had to carry the water up in a bucket from the neighbors next door. Uh, you know, it was pretty primitive. Uh, but uh, slowly we rethatched it, uh, began to fix up this 300-year-old house. In the meantime, after college, I moved to Kameoka which is just outside of Kyoto, and worked for 20 years for Oumoto, which is a Shinto, uh, so-called new religion. Not so new. It was founded in early Meiji, but uh, it was had the peculiarity in that it was the religion of the arts. Onisaburo, the founder, had said, art is the mother of religion, which is a, a bit of an unusual thing to say, because we usually think of of it the other way around, right? You know, that we have this, these great religious understandings and then that gets in, uh, uh, played out as art. But he said, no, it goes the other way. It's the artistic understanding that leads to religion. And it's through art that we can share our religious understandings with the rest of the world. And he and his uh, daughter, now he, who was the mother goddess when I was there, brought this, these amazing people. There was a great, one of Japan's great martial arts masters, tea masters, flower masters, weavers, potters. All these people were gathered around in Omoto. And so with that uh, background, uh, they, Omoto met up with David Kidd, who was a um, art dealer, who was a good friend of mine, a sort of mentor of mine. And David and Madam Now, he came up with this idea of the Omoto School of Traditional Japanese Arts that we set up in 1976. And what that was, it was a month of, of deep immersion. You wore kimono all day long, and uh, they did no drama, tea ceremony, uh, martial arts, and calligraphy were sort of the four basic things, but we also went to Dai Tokuji, where Zen masters would give us Zen lectures. We had lectures on Ag Aji, the, the meditation on the character A by Shingon, esoteric masters. We went to pottery studios in Bizen and and uh, uh, paper makers in Ayabe, and and it was it was really wide ranging. And pretty intense. We were shown gardens around Kyoto. Some of the, the gardens that are still my favorites today are the ones I saw in that very first seminar. 
and where it was special, and this has some bearing, I think, on, on where, where, I, where I think we're, we will be talking about generative tourism, and, and I think what you two have both been working on, is it wasn't about some kind of technique. So it wasn't teaching people how to be tea masters or something. Uh, because they were only going to be there for a month and then leave. Or they may, some of them were uh, uh, foreigners, uh, even Japanese in Japan, but they were still going to go back to their normal lives. So what were we teaching? Well, we were trying to teach the spiritual underpinning of it. And I remember David Kidd once said, you know, suppose someone comes to our seminar and they become fascinated by tea ceremony and then they they develop they devote the next 10 years of their life and they become incredible experts and they've learned every fine detail of it. Then we know we failed. Because what he was after was not necessarily that, but the people would be inspired by the underlying spirituality of it, which is what we were trying to present. And it ended up having quite an impact on hundreds of people around the world, a lot of whom are still active. So that was the background. I left Omoto in uh, 97, although I still live in the same town and I'm still friendly with them, but I don't work for the Omoto uh, organization anymore and then went on to do the same kind of program that I called the, the origin program in Kyoto, where we would, again, try to teach these arts to visitors and people living in Japan, including Japanese, in a way that made sense. Because, you know, you're given the tea bowl and people say, well, uh, you're, you're told that you have to turn it twice. And people say, why? And they say, because that's the rule of the Urasenke school. Well, you know, what? Who cares? There's got to be more to do it to it than that. And there is, of course. Uh, it's just, the, and the tea master probably knows that, but just isn't in the habit of explaining it or showing people, you know, what the point of this is. And that's what we really specialized in, getting deeper to the to the deeper reasons why you would do these things. Meanwhile, I had become fascinated by Thailand. By the way, I'm speaking to you right now from my a little study in uh, in my apartment that I rent in Bangkok, because I spend uh, uh, a third to sometimes a half of every year in Thailand and have done so for a long time, and became involved in Thai traditional arts. And we've done for years an origin program here, because again, it's it's actually worse than Japan. People come to Japan primed at least they may not know the details but they're primed to believe that japan has valuable traditional arts people come on bended knee and are ready to hear about zen and tea and so on thailand oh i mean no one ever never occurred to anybody that there are any arts it's the beaches and the shopping you know the nightlife uh, whereas in fact thailand has this incredibly rich history and tradition and traditional arts and dance and music and flower arranging and uh, uh, um, Thai design and many, many other things, and they're never presented to travelers. And so I've tried to do the same thing here. And so that has had, I hope, a the kind of transformative uh, impact that we aimed for in that origin program at, at Omoto. And I think this might relate to some of the things Steve has been trying to do with Japan 21. So we can come back to, to that. And also, actually, I would imagine what, Catherine, what you've been trying to do by showing people what the Gion Matsuri really is. You know, what is this festival that, that people come to? And it's a lot of fun, but it's never explained in a way that makes it intelligible. So part of what is crucial is a kind of, it's our role, I think, often as foreigners, to be the ones who translate these things. Otherwise, it's just fun and games. It's not what I would call generative. And there's nothing wrong with fun and games, but it doesn't go further than that. And so that's, in a sense, a, a bit of the mission. And there are people in uh, all the traditional arts in Japan and in Thailand who make these efforts, uh, but it's really difficult. Uh, so that that's one aspect. Um, another thing I wanted to talk about was, of course, restoration of old houses. And you're sitting, you're all sitting in one right now that soon uh, will be fixed up. Although with 15 rooms, you've got your work cut out for you, I think. <laughs> um, but uh, my starting point, of course, was this old thatched house, Chiori, 
in uh, in Ia Valley. And uh, we, as I say, it was very primitive for many years, but slowly we fixed it up and slowly people started to come. And pretty soon we found we were kind of renting it out. Uh, not completely. There was always some friend of mine who was there as a housekeeper and then other people would come and and uh, but, but, you know, we would start charging people to be there. And finally, uh, in the 2000s, I got the idea because, of course, I live in Kamioka, which is just outside of Kyoto, that uh, Kyoto, you could see the machia being torn down right and left. And I got the idea that foreigners especially would love to stay in some of these machia if they had a chance. We now see hundreds of them. We take for granted that that's what people do. But at that point, they really didn't. Uh, we were the first to actually do it. And it was believed that, that there was, that the, the travelers to Kyoto, especially Japanese travelers, they would only want to stay in a full service ryokan with the lady that comes in with your tea and the bed made and this dinner and breakfast served and et cetera, or a, you know, multi-story, sleek, Western-style hotel. It was one or the other. And so it was believed to be pretty much not possible to get people to stay in a Kyoto machia. And one reason that the Japanese side, certainly Kyoto people tended to believe that, was because these machia, as, as you all are probably experiencing as I speak, are uncomfortable. They're hot. They're cold. They were often dirty, they had horrible nightmare toilets, no proper air conditioning, no nice kitchen, et cetera, et cetera. All these things that would make it really difficult for foreign travelers to enjoy them, and Japanese too. So we said, okay, we are going to pull them into the modern age. And so we started renting, uh, we, we raised some money uh, through some private investors. We started renting a few machia. We start in Kyoto. We started fixing them up, and by the end of my term of doing this in Kyoto, we had done ten machia. And lo and behold, we thought it was all going to be foreigners. But by the time I left that company in 2010, more than 80 percent of our visitors were Japanese. Many of them from Tokyo, because it turns out that the Japanese are just as starved for this as the foreigners are. And of course, Tokyoites who've grown up in big modern buildings and don't even never see a tatami or a futon or wood or shoji or any of these things, they're also quote unquote foreigners. A lot of what happens in Kyoto, this life in Kyoto is foreign to them. It's exotic and new to them. They would love to experience it, but comfortably, right? So the key was bringing modern comforts, modern technologies into these houses, which we did. And once we had succeeded, once uh, uh, people in Kyoto saw that guests were coming, then others started copying us. As of uh, 2019, when I left in 2010, there were a 10 that we had done plus another 10 or so by other people. There are now well over a thousand or there had been at the end of 2019. It may have dropped during COVID, but it will come back. So, which I think is a wonderful success because it means a thousand houses that got saved that otherwise would have been torn down. But that's Kyoto. And although I'm glad that we did it, it's also true that Kyoto being this world Mecca, tourist Mecca, you could kind of do anything and they'll come. So the bigger challenge is the countryside which has been my base since my starting point, as much as I love Kyoto, was not Kyoto. It was Ia Valley, an extremely remote place. When I bought that house, when I bought Chiori, there was no road even. You had to walk an hour from the river down below up a little mountain path in this, you know, end of the world place. But those are the places that need, are in terrible trouble and are dying. And yet they're sitting on, on a wonderful heritage of landscape and agriculture and fishery and mountain houses and so on, much of which sadly has been ignored by modern Japan. And so my efforts uh, since Kyoto have really been in the countryside. And over these years, I've done around 40 some houses in different places. 
around Japan in Nagasaki and in Nagano and in Ia and, 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 and in Kamioka as well. And what we're aiming at is what I think of anyway as generative tourism. That is to say, not the big bus mobs of people coming in and taking their Instagram and leaving, but people that come and stay, people that spend their time, people that might have some genuine um, interest in the, in the location that they're going to. Um, <clears throat> tourism, you know, I'm officially a Japanese uh, a national tourist ambassador of Japan, but I've also written extensively on the damage and the downside of tourism, uh, the problems caused by over-tourism. And all of you who are, live in Kyoto see this every day. And there's so many issues, the overcrowded buses, you know, Kyotoites in some ways really suffer, very practically speaking, because they can't get on a bus because it's full of people with big bags, you know. Uh, you also have uh, the damage done culturally when you have an ancient meditative Zen garden and suddenly you have thousands of people tramping through it, uh, not to mention uh, the many other issues of that kind. But one of the things that that I that is a key point, and I've written and talked a lot about this, people somehow believe that there's too many tourists in Kyoto or in Japan. And that's the number is not the problem. As a matter of fact, Kyoto, if you look at the number of tourists per capita in Kyoto, Kyoto's 68th in the world, way behind Bangkok, Hong Kong, Paris, dozens of other cities which is to say that Kyoto could, has the capacity to handle far more than it now does compared to, when you, compared to other cities. The problem is management techniques. I call it technology. I'm actually about to start teaching a course in, in Japanese at a small university in Kyoto uh, in September on the technology of tourism, which has to do with management techniques. And maybe we can talk about that later as our um, day goes on, uh, but I wanted to just throw out a few issues. Um, one is we've reached the point, and this is international, this is not just Kyoto, it's, it's, a, it's all over the world, where we really have to think about capacity. There was this idea that, uh, kind of egalitarian idea that you know, tourists, travelers should equally have these wonderful opportunities to see everything. Well, no, that was not, that sounds nice, but it's impossible. You can only fit so many into the crowded Zen garden at one point. You can only cram so many into a museum until the experience becomes horrible and you get nothing out of it. There is a practical limit. Only so many can climb Mount Fuji before the garbage and the waste disposal and all the other damage becomes difficult to, to you know, it just reaches a, a, a tipping point. Uh, only so many, that's why they had to, for example, close the famous uh, beaches beaches in P on PP Island in Thailand, uh, because uh, the damage being done to the coral and the rest was almost irreparable. They shut it down for three years. So there is this moment in world history when we reached capacity limits, and we're going to have to think about what to, to do about them. And that can be all kinds of things. Uh, tourism, I think, is too cheap. Um, you know, there's, uh, too many things have been free. One of the reasons why you get a crowd of people in the buses coming uh, in their huge tour buses to these places is because they were bought by the tour agency. They don't know where they are. They don't know why they went there, but it was free. Well, if they had to pay just a little bit, they might think twice. And that has two benefits. One, it does come down on the congestion, but it also raises the quality, the level of your tourist, because it means that only the people that really want to see it will come. The people that really cared enough to go to a particular museum exhibition are going to be the ones that go online, sign up on the pre-registration, and go to that trouble. And that's who you want, because they're the ones who will stop for a minute pay attention to what they've seen, appreciate it, and the others can go somewhere else where it won't matter. Um, so that's one thing. Uh, for example, just speaking of, uh, of entry fees, uh, Venice is now charging 10 euro, that's 1,200 yen to get in if you haven't booked a hotel. 
uh, uh, there's an uh, article I just saw about uh, Bali uh, titled Eat, Pay, Love. <laughs> They're going to be charging a uh, $10 for all tourists to enter Bali starting next year. Now, of course, islands can do it. Other places, it's not so easy. But one of the issues, and again, we can talk about this, is something called zero dollar tourism. I was just in Hokkaido a few weeks ago in an incredibly beautiful area called BA, BHO, which is famous for its rolling hills covered with fields. Many of them are flower fields. Very beautiful, but they're getting mobs of people in tour buses who trample into the fields, damaging them, throwing away garbage, parking their cars, which prevent the locals from harvesting properly and et cetera. It's this, they are really suffering from over tourism and they get pretty much nothing out of it. Zero dollar tourism means the numbers are big, but no money is actually spent to help the local economy. In IA, they've got no choice because you can't just come in for a, a moment and take a photo. You've got to literally got to spend the night, which means you're going to rent a place and eat the local food and so on. In BHO, they come in on their tour buses, take the Instagram and leave. So they get over 2 million people a year for zero. So that's one of the issues is how to make it pay for the locals. There are many other things I could be talking about here, but I wanted to uh, be a little bit of devil's advocate here and read from you as, before I finish up now a few paragraphs from a wonderful article that just came out in the New Yorker and it's called The Case Against Travel uh, by Agnes Callard. And one of the things that I think we need to do is demystify travel uh, as if tourism was some kind of sacred uh, activity, something that just... Uh, by definition, it is beneficial to all who do it, do it and to mankind. We need to kind of reconsider that. And so she says, I'll just read a few lines from here. She says, at home or abroad, one tends to avoid touristy activities. Tourism is what we call traveling when other people are doing it. And although people like to talk about their travels, few of us like to listen to them. Travel gets branded as an achievement see interesting places, have interesting experiences, become interesting people. Is that what it really is? She says, a tourist is, tempor is a temporarily leisured person who voluntarily visits a place away from home for the purpose of experiencing a change. But what exactly gets changed? Here is a telling observation from the concluding chapter of there's a book she's quoting from, Tourists are less likely to borrow from their hosts than their hosts are from them, thus precipitating a, ch a chain of change in the host community. We go to experience a change, but end up inflicting change on others. And finally, speaking of um, these arts programs that I used to do, uh, I do feel that, that Passing on the spirituality of these arts and also the crafts, traditional crafts is very important. But sadly, I think a lot of the kind of nani nani experience that we have at Kyoto nowadays, you know, tends to be, uh, you know, sake tasting and a kind of 30 minutes of a tea ceremony and kimono wearing and geisha ghost playing and samurai, whatever. And, you know, it, it's uh, <laughs> one wonders what this is really doing for anybody. So she writes, for example, uh, yeah. I wonder if we could, in the interest of time and allowing time for questions at the end, is yeah. that all right place for you to end there? We can stop now. I was going to quote a funny thing she had to say about these activities, but it can wait. Alex, thank you so much. That was amazing. Yeah. Was, that was um, so great to hear so many details about all the different activities and engagement. I learned a lot from hearing that. Thank you. And, so um, the funny thing to last people. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that segues really nicely into what I'd like to talk about in terms of generative tourism. And um, I'd like to begin by outing myself that I was one of those people. I was one of those um, unconscious travelers that 
was really excited to go to a place and probably inflicted more damage than, <laughs> than good. And um, I had the opportunity to travel as a young person. And I, I look back and just think, oh my gosh, oy vey, you know? And um, for me, and like Alex is, is saying, it has been a real journey of transformation. And that's why I wanted to travel. And I just didn't know how much transforming I needed to undergo myself to really become the kind of tourist or traveler that that Alex is is talking about that that a place would want to welcome that a place would feel um, enriched by having as a guest and um, it's a, a little bit embarrassing but I, th I think it's important to be really self-honest here is that this process is, is still going on it lasted much much longer than you know I would like to admit and that was really um, very much my experience in the Gion Matsuri is uh, the, the festival is so amazing and, and I was so excited to learn about it. And there was all of this beautiful, incredible stuff that I was learning about and I felt very lucky. And yet a lot of the time that I was there, I was really kind of miserable. And um, yes, it's hot and yes, it's crowded. And those are some of the reasons. And, um, but ultimately, um, I, I realized that the reason I was miserable is because I was just there to get something. I was really trying to get something and I didn't even know what it was I was trying to get. So of course there was no way that I could get it if, if you don't know what that is, right? And I think that that is, um, well, in, in Buddhist terms, we call that greed and, um, it can be temporarily satisfied, but of, of course, when you get something neat, you sort of want to upgrade, right? So I, I got lots of great experiences and, and so on, but it's it's never ending. Then I just wanted the next one and the better one and, you know, oh, but I didn't get the view up there or I could get a, a better photo and it, it really doesn't end. And so fortunately for me, the Gion Festival is really about transformation its its origins are in this process um if we if we get technical it was about uh they believed that illness was caused by angry spirits and so it was a supplication to the spirits so that they wouldn't be angry right what can we offer you so that you're not angry what can we how can we entertain you right and so the music and the arts and the offerings and the rituals are all originally meant to transform these angry vengeful spirits into like oh you're you're not so bad after all okay thanks i'll have this exchange i'll receive your offerings and in exchange for that i won't be angry i won't be vengeful i won't cause illness instead i'll support you right so in uh, japanese it's about transforming what are called onyo angry vengeful spirits into what are called goryo uh, which are benevolent spirits that can assist you. And one of the things that's so interesting to me about this is I encountered the very same belief when I was living in the Brazilian Amazon. And when they do shamanistic rituals there and work with plant medicine there, that is a very important part of, of those rituals is, is transforming what, what they see as negative spirits into helpers. And um, the it's a, a little bit different, but but basically the same. They believe that there that if we act virtuously, the spirits will be so inspired that they will voluntarily transform and come to help us. So um, I feel like my time at the Gion Festival, I've been going for about 30 years. And, and I feel like there was a kind of surrender at one point when I realized um, I'm, I'm kind of trapped in a throng of people and I'm having a terrible time and I wish they'd all go away and this makes no sense because obviously it's for everybody it's not this experience isn't for me so there was a kind of surrender there and um, it was about realizing that surely I'm not the only person having this kind of a feeling right if you look around people are hot and crowded and and tired and um including the people who are putting on the festival, right? Have you seen the heavy 
things that they carry and put together and they're doing that all day. These people are on a very serious jag of sleep deprivation and dehydration, right? And yet they're putting on this festival for us the entire month. Their families don't see them for that month. The women are, you know, really holding down the fort while their husbands are are there putting on this festival for us. So I came to be very moved by this tremendous act of generosity of all of these volunteers taking time off work and contributing so much, you know, blood, sweat, and tears to put on this festival for a bunch of strangers who are kind of wondering where the takoyaki is, right? Mm -hmm. And and maybe don't, most likely don't know what they're looking at or what's going on or what their experience or what the history is and, and so on. So like Alex said, I think I think he had a great point. It it is it's great to just go and have fun. That's a really important part of it. And um yeah, I, I wish that for everybody. And there is also a very deep and powerful transformation. I, I think of the Gion Festival not as an object or a collection of objects, but it's a process. It's a process that they go through every year. And the people who put on that festival go through that every year with one another in their communities for each float. And they go together through it together with all of us, with whoever happens to be there. And I think the power of this process, which is a transformational power, really lies in our openness to experiencing some kind of transformation. So these are purification rituals. So what that's going to mean something different to every person, and that's as it should be. But but what does that mean to you if you're in the middle of a purification, a gigantic collection of purification rituals? That's going to mean something different to you in every moment. And that's going to open holding that question in your mind or in, in your heart, in your kokoro, is, is going to make things amazing things possible that that we could never imagine and and for me that is the purpose of the gyan matsuri is to facilitate the possibility of that experience of that process and when you are talking about well i i think it's basically true worldwide but since we're in japan and and thailand we can talk about these two countries a majority of the tourist attractions are um, spiritual locations like temples and shrines that have been used for hundreds of years for these transformative processes. Or they might be like Alex is speaking about with, with I, I'm so excited about to hear about origins. Um, the arts were developed as meditative activities for people who were not inclined towards sitting meditation. I don't, I don't know about you, but I'm actually, I'm not that inclined towards meditation. I find it kind of hard to sit still. Well, how amazing that this entire culture or cultures have developed around different things that you can do to still be in a meditative state, to develop a meditative state, which is all about facilitating this transformation. So in uh, the Buddhist texts, they say that there are three kinds of people. This is the bad news, okay? <laughs> just, just so you're ready. So the three kinds of people are hate types and greed types and delusional or ignorant types, okay? And, and we all are all three at some time, but we have our predominances. So the good news is that the whole point of any kind of spiritual practice, particularly Buddhism, but, but I think it's true for every spiritual practice, is that the hate type is transformed into a loving kindness type. The greed type is transformed into a generous type. And the delusional or ignorant type is transformed into a wise type. And so here we are in these countries that have these locations, temples and shrines and arts, the way of tea, the way of flowers. These are paths. These are spiritual paths designed to facilitate these transformations. And this is um, 
very generative. Ask yourself next time, the, the next time you're burning with anger, you know, just like really mad. Like, you know, how, how much would I pay if I could just sort of like transform this into joy? And we don't have to pay anything, right? We just need to open ourselves to the possibility and pay attention, which is what meditation is basically. So nobody else can do this for us. We each have to do this for ourselves. We can set up the supporting conditions, which is what all the folks at the Gion Festival are doing, which is what Alex is doing with origins and um, transforming Japanese countryside. Can you imagine how transformative that is for the local community, as well as for the people who visit there? Um, so we can set up the supporting conditions, which incidentally is hugely beneficial for ourselves as well. And I think, uh, of course, we all have a role to play. And what our role is, is completely unique and, and only each of us will know that for ourselves. But as educators or as um, hosts or as trainers, teachers, writers, um, yeah, we can help set up these containers to facilitate these processes. So that's it for me. And I'd like to uh, turn it over to Steve next. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I was very moved by what you said. Amazing things happen, can happen that we have never imagined possible. I, I love that. Um, as some of most of you, I, I haven't, I, I know a few of you, but most of you don't know. Um, I was in the, in the tour business for 30 years. I, I ran a company uh, bringing mostly, well, mostly North Americans to Japan. And it was, um, so I had the experience over and over and over thousands of times to see how people react, see how people resonate with the Japanese culture. And um, nowadays we see, you know, literally, it feels like tens of thousands of people are walking down the street like this. And uh, which, is, which is what it is. Uh, we, have, we have, there are many challenges that are occurring right now in terms of tourism. And maybe most of them are completely beyond our ability to, to really affect any kind of change at all. But there is enough of an opportunity that we, through tourism, this could be the most extraordinary golden age in the history of the world. And I'm not exaggerating when I say that. Um, when you think of all the cultures in the world, what country would, could better usher in a golden age of culture than Japan? I mean, Japan is one of the last great powerhouses of culture in the world. I mean, there are powerhouses everywhere, but it's declining everywhere at a rapid rate. It's, it's disappearing before our eyes. And Japan, even though things are disappearing in Japan, there's still more here in Japan than, you know, I venture to say that if you put all of the, for example, all of the master crafts, crafts that are passed down from generation to generation, all the theater traditions, the, the cuisine, the, the gardens, the architecture, the, the scenery, the accessibility, the affordability, the traditional arts, that tea, the, the way of all those arts of tea and and archery and, and calligraphy and on. I mean, I could go on, on and on and on. If you took all of that, everything in the world, I think Japan would have probably at least as much or maybe more than the whole world combined. <laughs> it, that's still being practiced today. I mean, there, there are great things that are, that are around the world that are they're gone. They're just, it's, it's like a, um, they're like little theme parks of, of trying to revive or at least maintain some awareness, but it still exists here. And um, so I see this is, this is an enormous opportunity uh, to utilize, to take advantage of 12, you know, basically 12 million people are coming here every year now. And 
um, you know, I, I, I did my own, my own, I, I would call cockamamie calculations. It's, but I, I'm, I'm thinking um, maybe 1% of those people are staying at, at, at very high-end hotels and they have concierges who can guide them to really wonderful experiences. And some of those have wonderful guides. And so they can, they can, they can experience the cream of the crop here, the cream, the absolute essence. And we have another um, 5% who I would say, I, I think Alex described them very well. These are people who will find their way because they have, a, they have a, um, their predisposed to have an interest in certain things and they do the research. And then we have another, what I, I, I call 15%. And I say, these people are predisposed to what's here, but they really don't know. And um, you know, a after 30 years of giving um, cultural lectures over and over and over and over, and Anne, my dear colleague, did this with me for so many years, um, it's, it's almost shocking how little the world knows about Japan. Uh, it isn't almost shocking, it is shocking. So I, I often say the world's, Japan's best kept secret is Japan itself, because you have this gold mine, this diamond mine of culture here, and even the Japanese, many of them don't even realize it. And the ones, unfortunately, you know, fortunately or unfortunately for Japan, is the Japanese in their culture, they're not, they're not, uh, it is not in their culture to speak about themselves and to promote themselves. So they're very, they're very soft spoken about these treasures. And for some of us Westerners who need a little hit hit in the head to be, you know, to some clear uh, directions like this is extraordinary, we don't, we're not getting that message. And so um, I see this as an extraordinary opportunity at this time for, for people to come here and uh, something to touch them in the heart, to really touch their heart. They bring back gems in their heart and they bring back things in their suitcases of extraordinary value, which create jobs for young people to make things that have been, the methodology has been passed down for sometimes over a thousand years the, with integrity, with focus, with, with passion, with pride, with all of those, the, all the qualities of things, especially in a world where our focus seems to be on AI, which is developing something in the head and, we need to balance that with a focus on the heart. Because if we're not focusing on things made by hand, things, things that are, uh, have essentially the, the joy and the passion of the person who made it, we, if we don't have the connection with the things we use in our everyday lives, it just becomes very sterile. Everything becomes sterile and meaningless. And so we have this culture here, which is, which is really, um, you know, now, I, 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 I run out of superlatives. You know, I, <laughs> I, I came here from Los Angeles in 1971. And you know, I often say, we, 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 I came from a, a, a culture eating off of plastic dishes. And I came into a place like this, where, where all the dishes were different and made all, all over Japan, all different kilns, lacquerware, bamboo things, shoji, tatami, uh, just, Everything was just handmade, hand done. You know, I was raised on Campbell's soup and frozen vegetables. And everything I ate here was just impeccably delicious. And um, that I never forgot that it made a huge impression on me. And, you know, the thought of going back to Campbell's soup has never really appealed to me. <laughs> so I left my cans behind me. Um, so what can we do? Uh, the, so we have so we have fifteen percent. I, I call these the fifteen percent of the people who I think if we could capture the hearts or capture the attention of fifteen percent of these tourists, that would be enough to usher in this golden age. Seriously, but how do we catch their, their attention? You know, all the old reliable sources of information are gone. You know, people don't read. Uh, you know, all the great guide, there were half a dozen great guidebooks before. And now, you know, wh where are they? You know, they have some things online. The guidebooks are not being read. They're not being, you know, there are, you know, I'm not saying they're completely gone, but the influence of guidebooks is really almost, is, is diminished greatly. Um, we used to have well, you know, wonderful articles in newspapers and magazines. And, and now it's just, 
just, you know, five things you can do in 12 minutes in yeah. Shinjuku. It's, it's just, it's all for the very short attention span. But the people who are looking for something of substance, you know, where is there, where is the substance for them? Um, so I think we need to give the 15%, these people who are predisposed, who don't know the, the, the value of, of Japan, we need to give them tools for understanding so that they become engaged. Um, so, you know, we, so the new sources, I'm, I'm thinking, okay, NHK World does a great job of producing uh, content for people to give them that sense. But any, for one thing, there's NHK World produces this great vision, but there's no link of how I can enter into that vision. It's like this idyllic town, which somewhere in, in the hinterlands, and they're making this certain thing, but I don't know how to get there. I don't know how to do that. So this there's a disconnect it's you know it's, it's a big carrot but there's nothing following that so i i think that that's an opportunity to connect um the mass the you know there's contemporary art and there's there's uh non-functional art in every country in the world and people are doing amazing things what japan japan's strong suit is their functional master arts master crafts that's the strong suit. And, and, you know, there's no country in the world which has, I, I'd say, you know, as again, all the countries in the world put together will not have the number and the depth and the, the, uh, of the Japanese crafts. That's Japanese, that's the Japanese strong suit. And so I think it's great to have, have um, contemporary art and, and um, conceptual art. I think this is part of our culture, but uh, this, I think more of an emphasis on these extraordinary handmade things is Japan has has a has a, a bit of a monopoly in that area, not a hundred percent, but maybe eighty percent. It's and it's enough to it's enough that if people knew the extraordinary accomplishments of the human hand, it's probably at the pinnacle of our the last hundred years, the pinnacle of the human ability to make things that can touch everyone's hearts. I think people knew that. They would they would resonate. Um, Naoshima, how many people? Many of you have been, I think, to Naoshima. Just an extraordinary place. Uh, and you know, uh, Anne and I together have probably been there about seventy five hundred times. Um, and and it's it's a it's a great and I love Naoshima. And it's it's basically contemporary art. And I'd say most of the people that go to Naoshima are not going there for contemporary art. They may discover co contemporary art there, but most people that go and they, they don't really know what that it's all about. But they're so, it's such an extraordinary place. So what if there was a Naoshima for the finest master crafts in Japan so that people could go there and they could actually bring something home with them, which would be, that would be, that would be spearheading an industry of, of pe giving young people opportunities to have careers that are so fulfilling, not just mindlessly clicking on a keyboard, but really fulfilling. Not everyone is, is, is um, not every person should be going to a university and studying, you know, IT or, or, or economics. There's some people that, that are geniuses with their hands, but we, 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 you know, I think we need to give those people some kind of we have to give them more um a little bit more energy mm -hmm. um how many more minutes should i no you had nine, I, nine minutes okay great I, I saw you holding your clock and i just thought well what can i cut out <laughs> um so anyway a a naoshima for the crafts could be you know it's it's a it's a it's a, a it's an extraordinary idea in terms of cost but it would be a, amazing um you know that we have infrastructure here in Japan. We already have museums, we have buildings, um, but the infrastructure is is often underused or it's underdeveloped. And I give you an example. You know, we have the Kyoto, the Miyako Messe in Kyoto. It's it's a craft museum, and they do a great job. It's a good location. They have beautiful things, beautifully beautifully displayed. They have a great gift shop. I'd give them an A plus. And then we have the Gallery of Kyoto Traditional Arts and Crafts. Right, right on Karasuma, right downtown, Karasuma Sanjo. The absolutely fantastic location, a beautiful building. Their, their crafts in there are impeccable. Some of the, the finest crafts. Um, and nobody's ever there. Oh, and you have people demonstrating. They sit there all day long and they're making things 
and in, in empty rooms. And nobody knows about them, but the Starbucks next door, I mean, you can barely get a seat. And so there's something wrong with the picture. It's, and, and I believe that if people just knew about it, not everyone, maybe, maybe the 80% of the people would never go, but the 15% would definitely go. Um, I, um, I think many of you have been to the, the, uh, the traditional uh, craft show every year, the Dental Koge show in, in, it's, it happens in several different cities in Japan, um, and I go every year, and it's a Takashimai, and, and just, just the most brilliant work every year, just brilliant work, and it's always at a time when there are, you could almost not move on Shijo uh, Dori right below with so many foreigners there, and in that room, I'm the only Western face, the, the only, let's say, Caucasian face in the entire room. There are no, and you know, I would say I'm probably the only non-Japanese in the entire room every year. The foreigners are walking on the streets. They don't know, even know about the most extraordinary craft show that takes place in Tokyo, in, in Nagoya, Osaka, Kyoto, and I think in Fukuoka. Nobody, they don't even know about it. There's no advertisement. I, I had a, a client who, I, you know, I brought a client there when I was doing tours and they wanted to buy a piece. You know, and, and of course the artists that this is their life, well, they have to sell their work so they could they can make more and they can they can pay, they can live. And it took this is in Takashimaya. This is not in some, you know, some barn someplace. This is Takashimaya. This is at the, the greatest craft show. And the person wanted to buy two little dishes, and it took 45 minutes to process them. They no one knew what to do. I mean, this is this is un, unforgivable. Yeah. This is well, you know, it's forgivable, but it's it's insane. <laughs> um, so anyway, that's that's these are great infrastructure, great uh, great. Um, they're great things that exist that they're being underused. They're they're not being properly used. Um, so uh, I see, you know, and the, there's a, many of you know of Tokyo Art Beat, which is which is I think is it's very it's a very uh, good source of information. You know, if there was a if there was a Japan craft beat that just focused on all the places you can go to see the genius crafts um, in, in department stores and galleries, just all the great places, uh, and it was focused towards the 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 fifteen percent of those people, I think it would it would really turn things around. But there's just it's so hard to you know you go into art beat and there's just there's tons of conceptual art and there's tons of this and tons of that and you can get to the crafts. But there's so much to get to, and and most foreign most visitors can't distinguish, or they can't discern what what that path would be for them. So that's, you know, a, a, a great site would be would be a, a extraordinary. So um, let's, so when we talk about the rural revitalization, and no no one has done more for that than Alex. I mean, he's you know we've taken so many tours and and had events at his at Chiori and they were they were extraordinary there was they they were tours they were they were visits of a lifetime to be able to do that you know I personally led tours in northern Japan uh, I did four tours a year for years and I went to places where to, uh, foreign tourists never went and just and there was no infrastructure for tours there was no transportation and there were no buses there was nothing and so I had to, I had to like gerrymander it, put, fix, put it all together somehow, and it really worked. But because of the place, when you get to the right places and see the right people and have the right experiences, it's extraordinary. But doing that, it's okay for a tour company, but for a, you know Mr. and Mrs. Smith just going on their own, it's you know forget it. There's you know, there's you know two buses a week going to some places. <laughs> but you know for all these places, and, and and I'm talking about, and I have a list here of some of the places that. Um, I could find what's on my list. So you know, places like, okay, Taka, uh, Tokyo, Kyoto, Kanazawa, Kamakura, Takayama are just saturated. But, and there's so much talk about these other places to be developed. You know, the Kumano Kaido has done a, a big wow. promotion and they're, they are reaping the benefit. They're, they have a, a huge influx mm -hmm. of tourists mm -hmm. and which is helping the local communities get, bring, bring jobs. It's, 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 it's revitalizing. It's taking the locusts out of the big cities to their area. Onomichi and the Shimano, uh, Shina, uh, Shinami 
Kaido is doing the same thing. But just down the street from Onomichi is Tomonoura, a delightful little town, just absolutely gorgeous. And you know, nobody goes there. And it's just, it's right outside of Hiroshima. Everyone goes to Hiroshima and Miyajima, but right on the way is this wonderful little town. And you know, uh, and nobody goes there. Um, you know, uh, Alex is, I think I heard of about Ale Uchiko from Alex many, many years ago. So I, Uchiko is one of my favorite places and it's in Southern, uh, Southern Shikoku in Ehime Prefecture. And it's this just gorgeous little town, uh, Edo period buildings, beautifully restored. And I, I, used to, I used to take tours there year after year. And then after COVID, I, I went back for the first time about two months ago and it was a ghost town. There was, I, we couldn't find a restaurant at night to eat dinner. We had to ask a, a, a coffee shop to make us dinner. It was that much of a ghost town. And the restaurants we knew were gone. Um, you know, you have a whole town of beautifully restored empty buildings. And if, if you put, if you put, um, if you gave craftspeople free rent to sit in the windows of those, of 10 of those buildings, it would be a mecca for crafts. It would just draw people. But, um, you know, and that's the kind of thinking out of the box, which is really not happening. I mean, in Japan, we, we see a lot of money going into, you know, setting up systems so you can use QR codes to find this and this and this, which is, you know, it's very nice and helpful, but it's, you know, just lots of fancy buildings in the X, XYZ Kaikon, but it's, you know, where where is the essence? Um, so uh, there are places like, and then places like, uh, all the places that I'm, uh, let me see, I have this list that I want, I'm so anxious to give to you. So Tamba Sasayama and Ta Tachikui are wonderful places. Karatsu, Hagi, Yame in Kyushu, Uch Uchiko, Gujo Hachiman. It's, uh, unless you know where to go, you could you could walk the streets for days and not, not have any experience at all. It's just not clear. Uh, Ia, Ia, of course, um, you know, we, it, it takes, an Alex and it takes a village to just to get a person through EO for the day. It's, you just don't show up at the station. You show up at the station and you just you're just lost. Uh, Toyama is a is a great city with a lot of great things. Takamatsu, Tokushima, uh, um, Aso, uh, Kurokawa Onsen, Iwate, Tono, uh, Sado Islands, amazing place. None of these places mm -hmm. have at least as far as I can remember, at least up until the time I was active in these places, had any kind of simple shuttle bus to take you from one little place to another. If you didn't have a car or if you couldn't afford a taxi to, to shuttle you around, then you were really lost. And even if you had a taxi, we know where would you ask them to take you? So that's the, the there's a great opportunity and there's not a lot of um, uh, infrastructure costs. We're looking at, you know, shuttle buses for a community. You know, we did this in Morioka. Uh, Morioka has all kinds of interesting things to do there. It's but you know getting to them is you know it's like a nightmare trying to figure out the bus system for a foreigner. It's just a simple shuttle bus that would stop make stops at all these different wonderful places would would turn it around and it would get people going there. Um, so the I think one of the last things I want to say is it doesn't take much to turn things around. You know we have part of this influx of people with with buying power. Uh, on one hand, we have someone. On the other hand, we have these these traditional arts which are are disappearing because there's no one's paying attention to them. So much energy is being placed into anime and into um, into manga and things and the you know cool Japan quote unquote that the, the things that have great depth and essence are being overlooked or being marginalized. And I'm not you know I have nothing against these these pop culture things. I like them myself, but. When you only have, when when that's all that's left, and and the things that gave birth to them are gone, it's it's mm. it's it's really it, it, mm. it's it's a tragedy. Mm. I'd like to leave some time for Q and A. Okay, so I'm just one more thing, and Alex's funny story, and I think that's it. So, um, just to give you a, a, one example, you know, 12 million, 12 million people coming every year. You have Gagaku. Gagaku is this is a, ancient uh, form of music it came from the, through the Silk Road. You know, it's 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 extraordinary. It's an extraordinary experience. All you need to have is 
if you had 20 people at one performance once a week for a year, that, that's enough to keep a Gagaku group going. It, we're not, mm. we don't, every person, 12 million don't have to mm. go to a Gagaku performance. Mm. It doesn't take a lot, but it mm. needs to be remembered and it needs to be included. Mm. And at that, I'll just say, um, let's, let's, uh, let's look for the opportunity and really bring on this golden age. Mm. Thanks. Um, so I'm dying to hear your funny story, Alex. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, so I'm back to being devil's advocate for, for what the value of all this really is. But uh, anyway, I, I rather liked what she said here. So she says, for example, a decade ago, I was in Abu Dhabi and I went on a guided tour of a falcon hospital. I took a photo of a falcon on my arm. I have no interest in falconry or falcons and a general generalized dislike of encounters with non-human animals. But the Falcon Hospital was one of the answers to the question, what does one do in Abu Dhabi? So I went. Okay. And she says, why would, might it be bad for a place like that hospital to, to be shaped by the people who travel there voluntarily for the purpose of experiencing a change? The answer is that such people not only do not know what they are doing, but are not even trying to learn. Consider me. It would have been one thing to have a, such a deep passion for falconry that one is willing to fly to Abu Dhabi to pursue it. And it would be another thing to approach the village in an aspirational spirit with the hope of developing my life in a new direction. I was in neither position. I entered the hospital knowing that my post Abu Dhabi life would contain exactly as much falconry as my pre-Abu Dhabi life, which is to say, zero falconry. If you are going to see something that you neither value nor aspire to value, you are not doing much of anything besides locomoting. Tourism is marked by its locomotive character. I went to France. Okay, but what did you do there? I went to the Louvre. Okay, what did you do there? I went to see the Mona Lisa. That is, before quickly moving on, apparently many people spend just 15 seconds looking at the Mona Lisa. It's locomotion all the way down. Thanks, Alex. <laughs> um, thank you, Alex. Thank you, Steve. So I'd like to open up the floor for questions.